Greetings, Audio Avengers. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that means it's time to get into the third episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier once more. Every week, we analyze the newest chapter of the MCU from multiple angles you will only find on this podcast. Our story cast is live, and Amanda and Maeve get into the theme driving this episode which is an interrogation of whether and when Mike can ever make right. And we get into how this episode relies heavily on tropes and archetypes of the noir genre to make it work. On Wednesday's Ponder Vision, Jesse Taylor and I are going to dive into the biggest, weirdest, and most fascinating questions that we cannot stop thinking about as we look ahead to episode four. We'll talk about Zemo's true agenda, Bitcoin in the Marvel Universe, and so much more. But this is our character cast, where we explore episodes of Marvel TV through the lenses of the characters themselves. We're going to get into the heads of our new arrivals, Sharon and Zemo, and we're going to check way in with Sam, Bucky, and Carly. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and to help me understand these characters better is an actual defender of the Constitution, Christine Kippins. Hi, Christine. What up, what up, what up? Yeah, well, oh, now you're making me think about Zemo's dance moves, huh? Boy, that guy can really (laughs) shake it. I cannot get it out of my head. And when you sent me that gif of him dancing in the club, I was just like, is it my birthday already? This is just perfection. How many takes do you think we're going to get in the bloopers of different dance moves they had Daniel Brühl try? Oh, my God. I cannot wait. Wait, was there a blooper reel for WandaVision that I didn't even? No, I'm saying when the show's over. No, but I'm saying WandaVision. Did WandaVision have one? No, WandaVision is wrapped. No, you're right. I'm never going to get to see his like white man overbite move or like the running man. Do you think Zemo could do the running man? I mean, based on what I saw, I don't think there's much he can do. It's true. Uh, and this is a more of a Pondervision topic anyway. I want to talk to you about the characters. Yes. Not what, you know, and we can talk about whether and how much Zemo shakes it if we want. When we get to Zemo, as per usual, Christine and I have each got a list of questions, but we have not shared our answers. And we are going to talk about the big four, Sharon, Zemo, Bucky, and Sam, plus Carly a little bit. And then, of course, Christine will have some questions for me. So it was incredibly exciting to see Sharon on the screen again. And I was not expecting the version that we got in Madripoor. Christine, I want to begin with this question. How did you feel when you learned, when you saw, when you realized what had happened to her? Well, to me, it felt like a big duh moment. I mean, of course, this is what happened to her. Steve didn't try to recruit her for his post-Civil War team. If everyone got a pardon for defeating Thanos and Sharon wasn't there, then she doesn't get to come back home. You know, she's a Carter. She's a fighter. She's a survivor. So I'm not at all surprised that she's in Madripoor and thriving. She was a beacon of moral certainty in the Winter Soldier film. And, uh, you know, when she would doubt someone, we would doubt someone. And her whole team looked to her when she stood up to Alexander Pierce. So I confess that my first reaction is, or was... This feels terrible. (laughs) Well, the thing is, like, time works on people, right? Like, it's been five plus years since we last saw her. We have no, you know, we really had no idea what happened to her other than Steve kind of abandoned her. Like, he literally assembled a crew of people who either refused to sign the Sokovia Accords or sign them and breached them. Right. And never once (laughs) went to check up on Sharon. So to me, I kind of felt like, of course, she's going to harden up during this time because if she's not wasting away in an American prison somewhere, she's got to be out there like scrapping for survival. But she isn't scrapping. She's got suits of armor and original Monets in her house. Dude, she's fucking thriving. I mean, and I feel like if you learn how to be a spook, you should be able to survive pretty well on the other side of things, right? Like if your whole business is information and hunting down bad guys, like you have to really understand how bad guys work, where the money comes from, all of that stuff. So you should be able to insert yourself into that world and make a killing at it. Well, speaking of killing, she's pretty violent and jaded in this episode, to say the least. 
The stars and stripes are bullshit. The hero game is a hypocrisy. Do you think there's any hope for a share in redemption? Or is that something to even root for? Well, listen, I like this new Sharon in case that's not obvious. <laughs> okay, okay, you're into like, it. Yeah, you're feeling I it. I died when she called Bucky Mr. America like he was Cap's Aww. partner. <laughs> you know, and I think that if you're going to survive in Madripoor, Sharon needed to level up a bit, and she did. Like I said, she's yeah. thriving. She's still in the business of intelligence. She could take out an entire squad of bounty hunters. I mean, she fucking maimed or killed eight men on her own. Did you count that yourself? Did you, did you, were you keeping track? Did you have like a little scorecard? I literally sat there with my hands like one, that's two, that's oh my three. God, that's awesome. Pause, that's four. So I love this new non-uncle fucking Sharon. Like, she's just focused on survival and being a badass. But as for redemption, I'm not sure she has anything she needs to redeem herself about. Like, what has she done wrong? I guess when I was talking about redemption, I mean, I don't know, she's a remorseless, ruthless killing machine. And it feels like the Marvel Universe tries to tell us that there are consequences to that because she mowed through a small army. I did not realize that the number was precisely eight. So that's good to know. But I would say that her scene is the single most violent moment in Marvel history. They are telling us a lot about that. Yeah, she she murders people close up multiple times. She stabs them like the ways in which she stabs them are visceral. And I have a tough time believing that that scene was meant to convey anything other than, uh oh. So I was doing some thinking about her, Christine. Mm -hmm. So we have Sharon in Madripoor. She is mega rich. She has all this suits of armor stuff like I was talking about. She also has a driver and she sure seemed interested in keeping tabs on everything. And I don't know if you saw her face when Nagel died. She didn't look happy. Mm -hmm. So those problems she was talking about to her mystery driver would make a lot of sense if she was the power broker. I am not at all shocked that you have led to this because you've actually preempted one of my questions mm. that I was holding for you at the end. So in response to all of this, Mark, I'm going to ask you, who shot Selby? Definitely Sharon. That I don't think is in question for me because she was keeping tabs on everything. What I want to know is who put the damn bounty on Sam and Bucky because if it's the power broker, then... I'm confused, but they call this episode Power Broker, and it feels very weird for that episode to have that title if we didn't meet the Power Broker. And I, right. I really honestly think we did, because unless we're led to believe that that car and driver situation is something related to the fact that maybe Sharon isn't quite so out of the game, then I don't understand what else could have been going on. And, you know, she was like, hey, it's I can get this Nagel information like no problem, just party and right. don't pay any attention to me. Meanwhile, Selby was the one who said, basically, almost nobody can get to this guy. So my feeling is that, again, to circle all the way back to this idea of redemption is, I think she might be bad news. And if she is, it fits with what we talked about in StoryCast around noir archetypes, because it makes her the ultimate femme fatale. So I am loving all of that. I also agree that Sharon was the sharpshooter, right? Okay. Because she was the person in the hoodie at the bar that left as soon as Zemo started talking to the bartender, right? So I figured she left to take a position in case things turned south. Yes. But then when she first confronted them in the street after saving them again, and Sam explained that Zemo was helping them track down who made more super soldier serum, she said that that explains why Selby's dead. Well, that's interesting. She didn't know yet what they were doing. And so, but you're right. It's like that. She should have said, then that explains why I had to kill Selby as opposed to that explains why Selby. Right. Dead. So she's, yeah, she's not right. letting them know that she was the one that shot Selby. Huh. And then when the bounty was placed on Sam and Bucky and Zemo, she talked about it later on as the bounty on their heads even though she was the one who did the deed. So as I was like working all of this out, I'm like, Sharon, something's up with Sharon. And then I watched the show one more time and I realized that Zemo never responded to Sam's assumption 
about not having a friend in Hightown. Zemo had a smile on his face when he heard that question and didn't say anything. That's a good point, too. Right. So I'm wondering if Sharon is Zemo's friend in Hightown. And that's as far as I got. I didn't go as far as she's the power broker, which, you know, power broker is always watching. And what was Sharon doing this entire fucking episode? Watching everybody. She definitely has something else going on. And that scene with her and her driver is part of something we will learn more about. I just thought it was really interesting. I'm intrigued. You looked a little skeptical when I said I thought that was the most violent scene in Marvel history. Do you, did you, you know, I know the Winter Soldier's had a couple of things where he's done some stuff, but the visceral hitting with the pipes and the knives into the arms and chest, like I could hear the sucking wounds. It was a lot, I thought. I, I, that's just where I landed on it, but I'm curious if, if you think I might be off base. I, I I hear you, and I've definitely, when I rewatched all of the Captain America movies, I was like, God damn, like nobody stacks up body counts like these Captain America movies. You're right. Winter Soldier was uh, more violent than most Marvel movies, for sure. But you're right. It's the violence. It's the John Wickness yeah, of it. The, that's a great way to put it, the John Wickness of it all. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I totally get that. And honestly, I love the fact that it's a woman doing it just because it's so rare that you see that type of violence come from a woman. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested to see where things go with Sharon. Like, I listen, the first time I saw this episode, I didn't catch everything, right? right. And I thought that when they said goodbye to Sharon, that was the end of it. And then she had that conversation with her driver. And I was like, whoa, we're seeing Sharon again. Like something is up here. How do you think Steve would feel if he could see what's become of Sharon at this point? Even absent the power broker theory, just watching right. her in her life now. I would hope that he'd feel guilty as fuck. You know, even though the choice was always hers to either help Steve and Sam by taking the shield and wings from government lockup during Civil War, I think Cap would feel it was his fault she is where she is now because he never went back for her to make sure she was okay. Yeah, it feels like a miss in his ledger, and those things yeah. kind of are stacking up over this show. Just a, t a little t -t touch, a little touch. All right, Sharon, we should table her until we learn more, which we might in short order. There's only three more episodes, so we got to get something at some point here. I want to talk yeah. about the king of the dance floor, Baron Zemo. Hey, he is a Baron after all. How about that? <laughs> I mean, listen, I'm, I'm surprised because I feel like they made a few changes about Zemo in order to appease the comic book crowd, right? Tell me more. He's a Baron now. I remember like my little, my little, you know, talk about Zemo before I was like, he's not rich. He's smart. He doesn't have a lot going for him other than that, you know? And now he's a Baron with a private jet and a classic car collection and so many resources at his fingertips that I'm really surprised were not frozen when he was locked up in Germany. Um, typically what you do with rich bad guys. But he also went from like struggling to learn Russian in order to read off Bucky's um, trigger words to being completely fluent in Russian now. Like it just, I don't know, it seems like a different Zemo, a slightly different Zemo. Now. I had that reaction the first time I watched it too, but here's what I'll say. Mm. It is not unusual in some countries for elite military positions to be reserved for sons of royalty or, you know, landed gentry or whatever. And so Zemo's past as part of the special ops group in Sokovia could actually fit pretty well with this idea that he comes from a rich family. And we do know that they sent his wife and son to be I think at her father or his father's place. In other words, some sort of estate, it kind of sounded like. And thinking about right. that in Age of Ultron, it's like, okay, it doesn't ex exclude the possibility that he is well off. Do I honestly believe that when they wrote Civil War, they imagined him as this wealthy? Probably not. But I don't necessarily think it's excluded. And obviously, they did know the whole time this was based on a character 
that was a baron, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I lessened that on a couple of the rewatches and feel like maybe they're just fleshing it out. But I don't know. And what the hell is up with them? And like not just being able to at least track his plane. If you're not going to freeze it, can't you just, right. I don't know, he's missing from jail. Go ahead and look for that on the flight charters and whatnot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Interpol sucks after the blip, I guess, is what I'm learning. I, listen, it's ridiculous. Yeah. But look, that's, you know, so many Zemo things we could talk about where I want to really get into it is over the simple question of whether or not Zemo is still a bad guy. Christine, is he still bad? Yes. The okay. fuck kind of question is this? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Yes. All right. See, all right. Yeah, I can make the case. I have more to say. I have more to say. I'm not just going to say yes, but like, I don't know if it's the New York City upbringing speaking, but anyone you can't trust is a bad guy. And Zemo gave us a few signals that he cannot be trusted. First of all, he tested Bucky with his trigger words. What the actual fuck? Right? That's so messed up. That's on my list too. 100% you cannot do that to him. That's messed up. You don't just fuck around with potential nuclear code combinations just to see if you might get it right. You just, Zemo is smart enough to know that you don't play with fire unless you're trying to burn something down, okay? He never agreed that he wouldn't make a move without Sam and Bucky's permission. All he said was fair. Mm -hmm. That is not acquiescence. That is not agreement. There is no meeting of the minds here. There is no valid contract. And Zemo self-identified as the bad guy. Sharon told the boys to stay out of trouble. And I think Zemo was saying he is trouble when he scoffed the word back at her. Then he proves his own point. (laughs) By killing Dr. Nagel, the power broker's man, after saying earlier in the episode to pray they stayed under the power broker's radar. Zemo still has his agenda to end all super soldiers, and Bucky better be careful. We talked about him a lot on StoryCast and how his objective is about preventing a sort of Machiavellian approach, right? Using super soldiers to accomplish her ends is a form of the ends justifying the means and doing these might makes right things. But he's still willing to use his might to make what he thinks is right. If he's willing to kill and steal and break out of prison and do whatever, he's still doing what he is accusing all the super soldier people of doing. It's just that, for example, he anything that surpasses his ability to do stuff as a wealthy person, he seems opposed to. He wants to stay on top of the pyramid. It doesn't feel like he's actually opposed to the pyramid. Mm hmm. Yeah, so that's why I think Zemo's still a bad guy. And I'm also with you on those code words to Bucky. The first thing he does is say something terrible (sighs) to Bucky just to see what happens. And I don't know, I didn't like it, didn't like it one bit. But Mm -hmm. I was impressed by a few things about him. And before I get to those, I want to know, was there anything about Zemo that impressed you? I mean, I love the fact that this man doesn't lie. Hmm. I, I think it's such a flex when baddies don't lie to achieve their goals. They can still be deceptive, you know, keeping cards close to their chest, using misdirection, not correcting false assumptions, capitalizing on distractions. To me, all of that is harder than telling lies. You know, I think he's still a little hypocritical and he's definitely still deceptive. So I'm not saying he's an honest man, but I don't think we've seen him lie once this entire episode. That's an incredibly cool point that I had not considered. I was impressed by his ability to manipulate everyone to his ends, which I thought mm-hmm. was consistent with his Civil War character. Yeah. He can charm you. He can scare you. He can confuse you. He was always what Sam and Bucky needed him to be in the moment. At first, he's deferential and respectful in the car garage and then again on the plane rides. But he's also able to take complete control when they want him to, like in Madripoor when they need to cosplay, in the snake (laughs) testicle bar, (laughs) as one does. So yeah, I was really impressed by his ability to do that. It's a little scary, though, too, which is why I just want to ask, what about him gives you the most cause for concern? (sighs) So I think T'Challa was right about Zemo. Vengeance has consumed him. And his time in prison hasn't cooled him down one bit. So what gives me the most concern about him is that he doesn't give a shit about the lives he destroys in order to reach his goal. He had no qualms about killing King T'Chaka or framing Bucky or taking over his mind. 
He didn't hesitate to murder Dr. Nagel. And while he has apologized to certain folks, he hasn't done so with any accountability whatsoever. He apologized to T'Challa at the end of Civil War by saying, you know, I'm sorry about your father. He didn't say, I'm sorry I killed your father. Right. You know, he said to Bucky in this episode, it was never personal. You were just a means to to a necessary end. There really wasn't much of an apology there. It was just like an explanation. <laughs> but these these bullshit apologies keep him at arm's distance from what he's done so he could continue his mission without any regrets or concern for the lives he's either ruined or ended. So that shit just scares me. Yeah, one small one and one big one for me. The small one was just that he confirms he's bad news when he tells that inside joke to his butler about feeding Sam and Bucky the rotten food. Right. That's how you know what he really thinks of them in case you were Mm -hmm. confused by their chumminess during the course of the adventure. He also seems invested in restoring Bucky as a weapon he can control. Probably not. It's, Mm. It's probably not an explicit agenda, but it is the first thing he says, which we talked about. And then later, after Bucky fights those guys in Madripoor, he's like, oh, the old stuff is still in there. It's like easy to bring it back out. He delights in Bucky's return to Winter Soldier form. I don't know. Kind of seems like a problem to me. He was so excited about that. And the fact that that's how he kicked things off in the beginning, just to like test and see what's going on. It's it's fucking frightening. The fact that he's this close to Bucky all the time. And you know how I feel about Bucky. I'll talk more about this later, probably. But oh. Yeah, dude, major concern. Yeah, there was that great physical acting moment from Sebastian Stan after he did his Winter Soldier ass kicking and Sam asked him if he was okay. Oof. Oh, the so look on his good. face. Mm. So good. Oh my God, Bucky must be protected at all costs. So he's breaking my heart while he's breaking people's bones. It's mm-hmm. tough. It's tough. So we've talked about our two exciting new arrivals, both of whom exceeded my expectations, I think, in terms of both the development that we would get around them and how much I enjoyed spending time with both of them. So well done to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier team. But now I want to return to our core duo, Sam Mm. and Bucky. Let's start with our guy, Sam. What resonated most with you about his story in this episode? So to me, it felt like Sam was a little bit of a fish out of water this episode, which I think is very relatable. He's off balance from the very beginning because Bucky is running the Zemo play and keeping Sam in the dark. (laughs) He's an absolute mess in Madripoor. He is not comfortable in the Smiling Tiger's clothes. He's out of place in the princess bar. He can't take a snake shot without making a big deal out of it. He doesn't know how to shut off his fucking cell phone when conducting espionage. And then when he has this phone conversation with Sarah, he is just terrible at acting. Absolutely I'm going to kill that banker. You just doggone know it. Oh, my God. And he was the... He was the only one who didn't know that museums actually display copies of priceless art rather than the real thing. So, like, our buddy Sam really shines outside of the U.S. when he's either strategizing or fighting. But he's he seems to be very awkward if he has to do anything else. Yeah, normally when you're a good person, it's hard to be something you're not, something bad that you're not. And I do yeah. think, for me, that's what resonated about Sam's story. He and I are both kind of hard on our sleeve kind of types of people. And he struggles at that cosplaying as, as a villain. And I get it, right? Because it would be hard to like let out some dark side of macho bullshit if you just really don't have it. Mm-hmm. And Sam was so empathetic and he couldn't stop being empathetic for yeah. Bucky and everything that was yeah. going on. And everybody could read that on him. And I thought that was really interesting. But were, were there any important takeaways for you for Sam based on what he experienced in, in episode three? Well, I think the most important takeaway for Sam is turn off your fucking phone when you're spying. (laughs) Well, yeah, that's a good that's a good takeaway. I'm guessing the roaming charges in Madripoor also pretty high. Right. You think the government's going to cover that? I don't know. I'm skeptical because this isn't an official mission. So no, but for real, any other takeaways you got for me? Yeah. Call shotgun before getting into a car with Bucky. 
come on right <laughs> also i like how he's like hey sharon get in but he's also like sidled up on her side like what's he want her to do climb in his lap i didn't like that, right, that either no. it's like his car his car behavior just generally needs an upgrade but no for real give me an important takeaway okay okay so i think that if he's going to be an international avenger he needs to become a little more worldly and comfortable in new situations. He has to learn to adapt quickly and just push down any awkwardness he feels. So I'm kind of hoping that Majapur is a little bit of a lesson for him. How's that for a serious answer? It's a good, that's good counts. That counts. For me, I think his takeaway is that when we make mistakes, when he makes mistakes or takes risks, the ripple effect can be a lot worse than maybe he realized. Because his initial instinct when he confronts Sharon is to not allow her to put any of that shit on him. But by the end of the episode, he's sitting in that plane and reeling, straight up reeling from what happened to her. He can't let it go. And I think he could even look at Bucky as an example of this kind of thing. Like Bucky is only the Winter Soldier because Steve wanted to pal around with him while they were hunting Nazis. And Bucky has suffered for decades because yeah. Steve wanted Bucky close, even though Bucky is not a super soldier. And I totally get it. Don't get me wrong. I get where Steve's coming from. You want your guy with you. But Steve was taking a risk with Bucky, and it cost Bucky dearly. And I hope, I hope, Sam can see how Sharon and Bucky are really closely related casualties of Steve's war. So for me, that's the thing that I, I hope he gets. It's something around this idea of the ripple effect of the damage that we can cause. It's, it's often worse than we realize. And I think he needs to take that home to the way he's pushing Sarah, too. Yeah, I think he's starting to get it, but he's putting it on the shield. He's not putting it on Steve. Ooh, that's a good point. So yeah. what about his blind spots? Is there anything that's in his way that's preventing him from progressing and evolving and growing as a person at this point? Yeah, it's that fucking shield again. Um, I think he's blind to the true meaning of the shield. First, he thought of the shield as Steve's and not as its own separate thing, right? What he didn't see is that the shield represents certain ideals and values. Steve saw that. And he tried to live his life in a way that lived up to those ideals and values, you know, making him worthy to carry the shield. And I can see how over time the two seemed synonymous. You could kind of understand why years later, Sam equated the shield with Steve and tried to live up to the man that Steve Rogers was, a man he idolizes. And no one ever thinks they're as good as their idol or else they wouldn't be called idols, right? <laughs> They'd be called peers. Right. So right. If, he, if he thinks he needs to become his idol, he knows that that's an impossible task. And that's why he kept rejecting the shield. He can never be his idol. But what he can do is embody the same ideals and values the shield and the name Captain America do because he already does. Steve saw that in him, which is why he trusted Sam to carry on the name and the legacy. But now he equates the shield with the pain and the super soldier program in general. It's Sharon losing her freedom to steal it. It's Isaiah being interned and tortured and nameless in order not to, quote, taint the mantle with, its, with his blackness. It's Nagel being murdered so that there's never another super soldier created. He's so focused on all of the bad things surrounding the shield that he's missing how he could be a beacon with it. And yeah. thank goodness Bucky is there to constantly remind him. I think it's just a beautiful conflict that his empathy, exactly what would make him an amazing Captain America, is now what's holding him back from taking on the role. That's so interesting. I saw that closely, but slightly refracted through a different lens. So mm -hmm. I do think we need someone with hope and earnest belief in our collective potential, I guess, to be the real new Captain America, not this fake new Captain America. But I was surprised at how much this episode revealed that Sam holds a genuine default trust in the system. Yeah. You know, He's just assuming that Sharon is going to be able to get a pardon. And he is obviously shocked about everything that's happening in the underground art world. And he is still clearly telling Sarah that they're going to get that loan or he's going to come up with something. He's an institutional 
optimist. Mm -hmm. I do think that will ultimately work out for him. I think it is a quality we need for someone who's going to try to embody the symbolism of everything that Captain America has the potential to be. But I think it's going to cost him along the way. I hope he has a reserve tank of this, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And and it's to me, it's kind of wild that he's like that because the years that he was with Steve was Steve's nomad years. When Steve was like, fuck the government, right. fuck international bodies, like, you know, the only people we can trust are ourselves is basically what he said during Civil War when everybody was debating on signing the Sokovia Accords. So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of wild that like his mentor and idol was on this path where he so did not trust these institutions to the point where he brought down both S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA <laughs> at the same time. And it's just, it's incredibly confusing and yet inspiring in a way that Sam has this faith. But then you got to wonder, like, Boo-Boo, are you just naive? Like, what is going on here? So it's, it's, I'm very interested to see how it's going to play out. Steve, I think, has probably imbued in him some sense of the idea that there is a pot better potential America. I hope it wasn't just it used to be better before this, because I think we all know how that's not the case. Right. And Isaiah functions in this story very much as a way to force people to not be able to look away from the reality that that mm -hmm. is a lie. But it is true that we're never going to get anywhere without some of that hope, without some of that earnest belief. Yeah. So that's why I'm I'm just I'm praying that it doesn't get beaten all the way out of him like three guys in front of Sharon Carter <laughs> <laughs> needed to go ahead and stick around, maybe dodge a few of those blows that are coming from the ruthless world around him. Eight guys, eight guys, eight guys. Oh, my God. She's <laughs> such a murder machine. Let's get into Bucky. Let's get into your guy. We want to talk about him a little bit. We're, let's begin, of course, with our, our our normal question of what resonated with you the most about his story in this episode. It, oh, man how scary it is that old habits are really fucking easy to fall back into. Um, Zemo scared me um, whenever he spoke of Bucky, you know, like at the very beginning when he was staring into Bucky's eyes and he said, something is still in there. On his way to Madripoor, he said to Bucky, you will have to become someone you claim is gone. Claim. Not someone from your past, right. Not your former self, not you'll have to pretend, but someone you claim is gone. And just because someone claims something is true doesn't mean that it is, right? And Zemo calling him out on this, tempting him twice, first with the trigger words and then with having him play Winter Soldier at the Princess Bar, really scared the shit out of me. And probably <laughs> Sam too, because Bucky, unlike Sam did an amazing job of playing Winter Soldier. A little too amazing. You know, so much so that you have to wonder if he's playing. And that's a major cause of concern. You know, Bucky's on this amazing path of healing and doing the work necessary to heal and be whole. But these paths aren't always linear. Setbacks will happen. And Zemo saying at the bar, it didn't take much for him to fall back into the form was a terrifying observation. Counterpoint, Christine. Sometimes it feels good to give in. What I mean by that is Bucky is to violence as like I am to junk food. You know, I know I shouldn't. I don't <laughs> like how much I want it. But sometimes I just got to have a cheat day. His excuse here is Zemo's cosplay adventure. That's great. For me, it's like, oh, it's like Halloween or it's Easter or, or we're at this. Well, in the old days, right, you'd go to a party where people would have things like snacks. Parties? I know. It's a what are weird those? concept. All of that shit is excuses, whether we're talking about Bucky or we're talking about me. But sometimes you got to be bad and sometimes being bad feels good. I will not disagree with that at all. Sometimes being bad feels good. But you saw Bucky's face afterwards. That shit did not feel good. Yeah. Well, that's like me. When I'm queasy and I've had too many Cadbury eggs and it's just <laughs> it's a bad situation. It's like my lactose intolerant friends when they pass by a pizza store and they're like, the pain will be worth it. 
Let's yep. go. <laughs> it's all calculated, you know? We're trying to figure it out. And I do think he had a binge, and he kind of regrets how much he enjoyed it, but uh, at the time, it was probably still worth it. But look, was there an important takeaway for Bucky from his experience in this episode? Well, I hope that Bucky realizes that he, too, is a leader who could plan ahead and put himself on the line for a mission. For me, this was Bucky's episode between the two of them. You know, he made the call to help break Zemo out of prison. He convinced Sam to get on board with his plan. He was flawless in Madripoor. He tried to call the play when the secret containment rooms got blown up, but Sam just ran out like Gamora on nowhere. And he ends up in the shotgun position at the end of the episode, reminding us that he too is a titular character. So, so far his plan is working. And I thought Bucky really shined in this episode. I also think that the darkness he thinks is unique to him lurks within most of us. Oh, yeah. He should, right, be looking at Sharon and seeing that even someone with a heart of gold can definitely break bad in the right circumstances. So my hope is that he can cut himself some slack, but he still seems hung up on this idea that it's about him and he is somehow worse than all of these other people. I also think this episode drove home how much he is still not living in the present. Conversation about Trouble Man and his love of 40s music, which we then proceeded to literally get uh, surrounding him while they're in Madripoor. But it's not just that. It's not even just that he's caught up in his amends. He's just hung up on Steve. He's The Winter Soldier cosplay was all tied up in this too. And I'm hoping that those conversations and seeing all of this will help him fully internalize the fact that he is not uniquely bad. Dr. Rayner has basically been trying to drive that home, and yet right. it's still not there for him. And I think it's holding him back. Yeah. But, you know, the other takeaway is, does Bucky have a Wakandan girlfriend? I mean, I kind of want him to. Because <laughs> did you take my... that? Did you see? Did you think they were like personally connected? Like maybe not romantically necessarily, but did they, they knew each other or no? That that they knew each other. Yes. That they biblically knew each other. Mm. No, no. I didn't get that vibe necessarily. Listen, I think Bucky made friends while he was in Wakanda, you know, and and listen, maybe he got it on while he was there. Why not? You know? Um, yeah. But I just, I don't know. I don't necessarily get that vibe from them. No, look, it's Sebastian Stan, so maybe it's just everything is too sexy and I just can't handle it. But there was definitely something in the way that he looked at her. I just thought there was maybe something there. We'll definitely learn more at the beginning of the next episode. And I cannot wait to see... Uh, I do not mean to reduce every woman who shows up on screen as a love interest to one of these dudes either, but I just, there, he has chemistry with everybody, so I should probably not read anything into it. End of story. He's End of just story. liquid sexiness. That's yeah. all he is. All right. Enough about whether or not Bucky has a robust Wakanda dating life. What's his blind spot at this point still? I think he's still blind to the personal struggle Sam has with carrying that shield. It's complicated. For Sam. To be fair, Sam hasn't articulated all of those concerns to Bucky, um, but a lot can be inferred from what he was saying outside of Isaiah Bradley's house right. and what he was saying on the plane on their way to Riga. So Bucky is just focused on what that shield means to him and the world, what Steve's choices means to him, Steve's legacy. And he's not putting himself in Sam's shoes. So he could use a little bit of Sam's empathy superpowers right now. Yeah, he is definitely not connected with that. He's so focused instead on stealing the damn thing. And that's what right. I'm hung up on, that he's hung up on, because he brought it up again that he wants to take it from Walker. And do what with it, I don't know, because I don't think he's especially saying he's going to take on the mantle of Captain America. He just seems to want to take it and bequeath it to somebody else. He's clinging to it like it's some weird totem because it's, I guess, the closest thing to the one guy who ever believed in him. I don't know. He still can't see himself clearly and he needs to stop waiting for somebody else or somebody else's weapon, I guess in this case, to clearly declare him worthy. So the shield, the heist Aww. of the shield, all of that is in his way. And I love what you're saying, which is really he's not able to recognize how much it's a, uh, Sam's experience and, and relationship to that shield is its own huge, complicated situation. 
Oh, you just broke my heart with the worthiness. And just bringing back Thor's arc is just always an emotional moment for me. Oh, yes. If only there was a hammer that Bucky could pick up to let him know that he's worthy. And and Steve isn't the only one who can tell him so. I mean, at, at the same time, that's a bit of a cheat, right? Like Bucky has to realize that for himself. That seems to be at the heart of everything that he needs in order to be present in the present, be forgiving of himself. It doesn't mean you don't acknowledge your mistakes. It doesn't mean you don't have regrets. It doesn't mean you don't. You aren't the person who did those things. But man, you got to be able to move forward. And his obsession with that shield is a crutch. So it's funny that we each talked about a blind spot. You for Sam and me for Bucky that really comes back to that disc. It is as much of a weight as it is anything else at this point. What did Sam call it? A hunk of steel? We talked about that on StoryCast. Yeah. From where we started, where his reverence for it is like the defining shot of the opening scene of the first episode to now, it's an albatross at this point for both of them. It really is. It really is. Yet another one of Steve's flaws (laughs) coming to the surface. But, you know, I I do want to talk about Bucky's connection to Steve for a second being something that's kind of holding him back. And I feel like that's signified even in his book, because I thought he just had a similar book to Steve's. But then we find out it's Steve's actual fucking book. And I'm just like, oh, my God, like Bucky's story is just getting sadder and sadder by the minute that like, you know, Steve probably gave it to him like, hey, This helped me catch up, right? So like, watch Star Wars, listen to the Trouble Man soundtrack. Like this will help get you from 1940 whatever to now. And it's just this constant reminder of like Steve's journey and how fucking different Bucky's has been from When the two of them used to be literally side by side, lockstep, experiencing everything together. Steve's book was all about how to move forward. And Bucky's use of the same book is only about the problems of the past. It's a it's a you're such a great point that you're right. It's all tied up in that book as much as it is anything else, which is why he's so protective of it when Zemo is flipping through it and making light of it. And also, I think the implication there is Zemo pilfered that off of Bucky somehow without Bucky realizing it, because it's not like Bucky would hand it over. So right. again, Zemo showing that he sucks at his heart. Yeah, I was I was very upset about this whole pickpocket thing. I was just like, where did this come from? I yeah. do not trust this man. How did this happen? This episode proved, though, that in a TV show, you can just skip the part where they show you how they did it, like Bucky getting that access card inside of the Machiavelli right. books. Like, it's just in there. What What are you reading? Oh, there's already an access card in there. Let us never speak of it again. All right. Never. Sh- sure. <laughs> you, you win. No, but look, let's turn now to someone you are a little less fond of than Bucky, and that is Carly Morgenthau real quick. I want to talk a little bit about her. First of all, did you find her performance any more compelling or did you still feel aggravated by her presence in general acting? I'm not aggravated by it. I just (laughs) think she could do with more classes. That's all. That's all. I do think that that makes some sense because when there's scenes like her trying to say things like that's the only language they'll understand, like those lines... They land like at a B for me. No, they're not definitely not landing at like an A for me. So I hear you. I hear you. I maybe am just projecting a little extra into that performance because especially in this episode, we learned a lot more about her mission and it's completely different than what I understood before. Can I just ask you really quickly? I didn't list this as one of the things I wanted to ask you, but like, did you know that it was the people who who stayed who were displaced because my assumption was always it was the people who came back who were displaced which is why we thought it was an anti-refugee position that they were taking in the past and yet now we learn this so were you as surprised by that this is my whole answer to your original question though of like well my question is did this change how you feel about her yeah i should have just finished my damn question but that's the question right And my response was going to be, and it is now, the more they explain about the Flag Smashers, the more they reveal I've been confused about their mission from the very beginning. So I get that they're facilitating the transfer of much needed supplies to people who need them, but I was confused about to whom. 
So I wanted to take things back. In Spider-Man Far From Home, Aunt May was raising money for displaced people. She talked about surprising the family who was living in her apartment, right? But then we didn't get any more details after that. And I just assumed that Aunt May was homeless and raising money for herself and people like her. So my question to you today was going to be, who are the displaced? And do they differ from country to country? Are they the people who came back, thereby losing their property? Are they only the renters who came back? And those who own property outright got to reclaim their home? Or are they the people who survived the blip, moved into seemingly abandoned property, and then are forced out once folks are blipped back? Because of Spider-Man, I thought it was the former. But now, with this episode, I think it's the latter. The folks who were displaced are the people who existed during the last five years and have been forced out of their new homes to make way for the people who blipped back and occupied them before. But when Carly said in the previous episode that the GRC cares more about the people who blipped away than the folks who remained... I thought she meant that all of the resources were going to the people who came back, meaning that the people who came back were displaced and she was stealing from GRC camps to give to people who existed during the past five years, but were still struggling. Right. That's exactly how I read it, too. Yeah, because the German Internet Cafe guy seemed like he'd been around for the past five years running his business. But then Mama Donia was in the GRC camp and Carly was talking about having been displaced herself. So who knows what the fuck is going on? And this is all to say, I find their story very confusing and boring. And I'm waiting for the power broker to come in and jazz things up a bit because I am over the flag smashers. Well, I think that's fair. I'm not there yet. But here's the thing. I went back and looked at the scene from Far From Home. And what Aunt May says is that they're raising money for folks displaced by the blip. And I do mm-hmm. think a re- a basic reading of English is that the people who are displaced were associated with the blip. But of course, that could technically mean people who are displaced because blipped people returned. But I feel like if that was what they meant in Far From Home, you would say something like, for people displaced by those returning from the blip, right? That's Mm -hmm. what you would say if, like, you lose your house because somebody who owned it five years ago comes back and suddenly you're on your ass. So I I think, and also, I don't know a ton about property law, and I intend to ask Jesse some questions about this. Maybe you know some things also, but, like... Possession matters on these things. And if I'm in this house and I've been there a couple of years and everybody knows it and the government knows it and everybody's signed off on it, I think it's harder to get it back than it would be for me to have to like keep what I already have. Yeah. Before you talk with Jesse, look up the term adverse possession and Ooh, come okay. ready to spar with him on that. Okay. I will do that. I will do that. So I do think Lamar made it clearer in this episode. I think the opening ad from the GRC, which was pitch perfect in its just mm-hmm. frustrating naive day. I think they were trying to fuck with us a little bit in this show. At least I hope so, because otherwise it's just can been confusing as hell. Right. I I think they were trying to surprise us a little bit with how how the flag smashers worked here, because we all had the same reaction. Anybody I've talked to who has watched this episode went on the same journey that we just talked oh, about that you just God. mentioned. So. Part of that, I think, is by design. I have to hope so. Otherwise, I want to explain, you know, it's a little writing room 101 for the MCU folks. Just next time, go ahead and make sure we know what your villains or anti-heroes agenda is because the mechanics of the blip are not something we have any personal connection to. I have no idea how a government would behave. I have my theories, and they were, in fact, the opposite of what you were doing. So there was no way for me to know until you told me who was the one who was displaced. But again... I feel like it was probably intentional. So all of this is to say, I am also much more on Team Carly than I was before. And honestly, I know they had her blow up a building with people in it in order to establish that we shouldn't be totally on her same page. But I do have some questions about when and where the limits are on what is acceptable uh, behavior when you have been, you know, sort of completely abandoned by broader society. But I would love for Sharon Carter to sit in on that episode, on that conversation when you have it. Sharon Carter probably just have me killed and then you'd never have (laughs) a character cast again. 
Look, I think all five of these characters are on a journey and I'm excited to see more about them. What do you have for me that we haven't talked about yet? You got some questions? Yeah. So let's go back to Zemo for a hot second. Was there anything in this episode that surprised you about Zemo? Because I was a little surprised. Well, definitely the money thing. Even if he'd had a title, that wouldn't have shocked me. I would have been like, well, sure, he's fallen nobility. The country Mm -hmm. is gone. But the fact that he had a butler, that he's the Bruce Wayne of Sokovia. Yeah, that surprised me. I would say that what surprised me was Zemo kind of being a candidate for hashtag not all white people. Mm. I thought he had the line of the episode when he said only an American would think that a fashion forward black man looks like a pimp. Like that just floored me. I I love that line. Yeah, it was great. And his trouble man line that Sam was like, he's out of line, but also he's 100% right. Here's the only reason that didn't shock me is that if you've ever hung out with any white Germans, they are very focused on how fucked up Americans are about race. <laughs> nice. It's real on the surface. They talk about it like at the drop of a hat. They have lots of capital O opinions about it. Yeah, but I have to say that like that plus the conversation on the plane kind of underscored how Bucky might have some insensitivities when it comes to understanding where Sam is coming from, you know? But I was just like, damn, they got Zemo playing that role and and it's seamless. You know what I mean? So it was a little surprising for me. Okay. So another question for you about Zemo. What the fuck is up with that mask? And is there some hypocrisy in him donning it? The mask is a complicated fashion choice. I want to like it, Christine. I have been trying to make myself like that mask since I saw it in the trailer just because... Is this fetch? Yeah, it is. It's totally that mask (laughs) is so fetch. In the comics, there's this kind of pink purple mask that Baron Zemo wears with like black stripes, pinstripes on it. And it has a little crown. And there's just something about his look that is always, I always thought was cool in a bad guy way, but cool. And so when they were going to put this Zemo in a mask, I just, I've tried to get on board with it. I don't think there's anything special about it. I think they just have him wearing this mask and... He looks more like a Muppet than he does a supervillain in it. And I'm (laughs) struggling to stick with my pro-mask Zemo position. That mask plus the fur collar was just not doing it for me. I prefer Zemo in a club dancing than Zemo on some containment thingies. <laughs> For, uh, I'm so sorry, listeners. Mark sorry, just, just did literally an amazing did the, the Zemo of the dance. jacking it dance. <laughs> Okay, let's leave Zemo on the dance floor. Um, Let's talk about Captain Douchebag and Battlestar Galactica for a moment, even though it pains me. First of all, I would just like to acknowledge that a German man spat in John Walker's face, proving yet again that not all heroes wear capes or carry shields. And yeah, a lot. And once again, the German white people have have capital O opinions about American imperialism and race relations. Mm-hmm. So, what did you think of Walker's roid rage? Do you know who I am? Moment. I think it fits exactly what we predicted was going to happen with this dude. Was that he was just going to crack under the pressure of trying to be this impossible thing? We just spent most of this episode talking about how Steve is this idol. You were so you know clear about like how this is going to hold Bucky and Sam back. Well, guess who else it's going to hold back? Mm -hmm. Your favorite person in the world, John Walker. (laughs) For me, that moment was extremely indicative of his character because he thinks the shield and the title of Captain America provide him with certain privileges and stature rather than the shield and the title being an ideal to live up to. And I was just like, you fucking douche he cracked like that was not acceptable and that's despite the fact that lamar didn't even translate just how insulting the german guy was about americans being brutes Mm -hmm. lamar tried to protect john and it also tells me that lamar's not surprised that john has a bit of a temper which Mm -hmm. should be alarming to us and the last time we see Captain Douchebag and Battlestar Galactica, they're several steps behind Bucky and Sam, but still on their trail. And Douchebag decides that they're going to spice things up a bit. And he says to Galactica, if we get the job done, you really think they're going to sweat us on the how? Is he wrong? 
No, he's Mm -mm. 100% right. They're so desperate for Captain America to be someone that they can control and this guy, basically, that they would just love for him to be able to get the Flag Smashers. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if they were going to find new and exciting ways for them to break national or international law in order for him to get a win. And the thing is with me, when I heard him say that, and I really tried to like have this conversation with myself about whether or not this is something I could, you know, dunk on him for, I was like, this is kind of how the Avengers operate. Oh, that's a good point. You're saying like, it's not even about the fact that the government sucks. It's just like, in many ways, the ends do justify the means. I mean, but the difference is the Avengers were willing to accept whatever consequences come with that choice because they believe they're doing the right thing. Except the Sokovia Accords. Right, except the Sokovia Accords. But, (laughs) but they, no, but they were willing to accept being on the run for two years. You know what I mean? But I don't think Walker expects there to be any consequences because of the uniform that he wears. I think they also might be setting up Lamar to turn on John Walker when the time is right. I think I mentioned they fought in the comics. And it won't surprise me if there's a point at which John Walker is too much for his guy Lamar, for, for Galactica even. And maybe he'll redeem himself after just constantly walking around in this guy's shadow like it's the place to be. Yeah. No, I would very much look forward to seeing that. And I have one final question for you, Mark Filetti. Thus far in the show, for the most part, whenever living folks or countries are name-checked, they show up later on. Nagel name-checked Erskine. Do you think that will have any significance for a potential appearance? Well, I guess I want to turn this back on you. In what way could he return? Do you mean in a flashback? I think that... A connection to Erskine has a potential to be a round. Like another person, a descendant, or? Who was his opposite? The Red Skull? No. No. Oh, Zola. Zola. (gasps) Ooh. Now, I mean, you're speaking my language and you're talking about Zola. (laughs) You can't kill a computer guy. We got to have some more Zola in this universe, right? I mean, it'd be kind of exciting, right? I love that extrapolation. Your thought was Sharon could be the power broker. And by like multiple rewatches, I was like, oh, but what if it's Zola? And that would make Nagel's reaction make so much sense because, you know, Zola would be thinking and talking about Erskine and that would be who Nagel would want to surpass because the, the guy that's funding him, the guy that he's trying to work for is so focused on this other guy. Erskine would be the Steve Rogers of the super soldier serum scientific community. Right. The guy you'd be dying to beat to live up to to surpass. Oh my God, that's that's a great prospect. And now I'm excited by that. And honestly, as much as I do think this episode really teed up Sharon as the power broker, it feels out of character for her. Even the whole thing about her living a life of decadence feels out of character. So I suspect we're missing something I can't wait to find out what it is. And it is probably not that she's a power broker. I mean, I also do think she's the power broker, but definitely not the power broker at the same time. <laughs> so the Zemo thing gives me something else to latch on to so that I stop spiraling. I mean, Zola being the power broker is definitely a fun idea. But at the same time, I would love for there to be a Sharon Zemo connection somehow. Yeah. You know, I want her to be his friend in high town. And if Zola is the power broker, that would explain how he was able to instantly get his Bitcoin bounty out on things and everything because he's in all the systems and he just immediately is like, bang, this is what's happening now. And it's not so far fetched because basically Ultron already did this, right? Like Hmm. he was everywhere at once just by using the internet and was able to make so many copies of himself. Like we saw that relatively outdated bunker in Jersey, where Zola lived, that might not be the only Zola. That might just be the American Zola, as far as we know. Oh my God, multiple Zolas. That's even scarier. That's even scarier, Christine. I'm here to scare you, Mark. All right, one more crescent, Christine. Where can people find and follow you? People can find and follow me on the interwebs at Kippens K at both Twitter and Instagram. And if you're into bi-weekly shenanigans about TV and movies, you could always check out my podcast, I'm going to need more wine. 
All right, podcast powerhouses, that is our character cast for today. Again, check out StoryCast and keep an eye out for PonderVision. That's coming on Wednesday. But of course, if you're enjoying this show, tell a friend. We're still new. We're getting out there. We've crossed that 20 mark of five-star reviews on Apple. But if you haven't left us one, please think about doing so. It would mean a lot. Feel free to include your thoughts or questions in there too. All of that makes a huge difference. All right, until next time, Christine, I got to go drink a snake testicle. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, man.